Hello and welcome to chocolate fans of all flavors. No matter where in the world you might be tuning in from today to this edition of the Chocolate Life Live. My name is Clay Gordon and today, today we're going to be taking a deep dive and deconstructing the cut test, one of the fundamental tools that is used in the chocolate making process. But, right, what was it created for? How are people using it today? Do they know how to use the cut test properly, how to interpret the results and what not to do? Those are just some of the issues we're going to be talking about during this edition of the Chocolate Life Live. Hello and welcome everybody to this edition of the Chocolate Life Live. And as I mentioned today, the, um, the topic is the cut test. The cut test is a very fundamental aspect of the chocolate making process. It's used to gauge um, the quality of cocoa. Uh, but you know, one of the things I, I need to do is I need to go put in today's post on the Chocolate Life a link to um, the session that we did on quality in the last couple of weeks because quality is a very, very interesting attribute. So today we're going to be talking about what the cut test is good for, what it was designed for, what it's not good for. And if you are someone who uses cut tests, maybe some things you can do to take your um, cut test evaluation game um, up to uh, the next level. Right? Um, and I want to remind everybody that if you're watching live, you can go to the comments and you can, whether you're watching on YouTube, Facebook, or LinkedIn in the chat, uh, put your question in and I'll get the question or the comment. Um, get it up on screen to make sure we get it answered during the course of the hour. And I do want to do a quick shout out to George to say, hey, thank you very, George, for, for saying hello and for tuning in today. Um, and yeah, just, you know, if you want to, just if you just want to say, hey, wherever it is you're tuning in from, let me know so I know, you know where we are in the world today. So what I want to do is I want to start off with this, you know, fundamental question. So why cut tests? Right. So um, a cut test is a visual observation of um, characteristics of cocoa beans. And these characteristics of cocoa beans that we can see with our eyes are ones that we would think of as objective defects in cocoa beans. So this is what we're looking to do. We're looking at the cut test as a quick screening tool, right? To be able to either accept or reject beans right, based on some observable characteristics. So one of those characteristics is going to be um, fermentation. So is a cocoa bean fermented? Is it fully fermented? Is it partially fermented? Is it unfermented as slaty, or sl which we would all call, also call slaty? So that's a visual observation that we can make about the beans. We may look to see if, there, um, if the bean is fully fissured, so the opposite, one opposite of a slaty bean is if we see the bean is fissured and cracked internally. So that will tell us uh, some things about, again, the, the, the level of fermentation that's involved. We might look to see if there is any internal mold or mildew in the beans. Um, there might be some insect damage. So we might think, see things like spider webs. Um, this is what it is that um, a cut test is good at doing. And I think that the primary thing that people are looking at um, when they look at cut, at cut test is what is the percentage of what we would think of as well fermented. So what percentage of the beans exhibit fissuring and are 
in the case of um, beans, which turn out, which start out violet, are slate are um, are fully fermented. That fully fermented observation is a little more difficult when we take a look at um, white bean cocoa. But if we're looking at a a, at a purple bean cocoa, um, what we're looking for is oxidation colors. We're looking for brown in the fermentation and the drying stage. So these are objective measures that we can look at. But what does that really, really mean? So really why cut tests, right? So cut tests are a modern invention. They are part of the industrialization of the manufacturing of chocolate. Before there was a need to be able to produce a consistent tasting chocolate. There was actually no physical need, right, to be able to perform an objective test. You know, the beans would show up at the port and the beans were the beans. Um, and there wasn't the sophisticated commodities um, trading infrastructure that we have now, right? And so one of the things that the cut test was designed to be for is that, designed to facilitate is that I could be a buyer in a country um, say the United States, um, I could be looking to buy cocoa beans from someplace else in the world, and I would have no physical way to uh, see the beans before they got shipped. And so the idea of a cut test gave me a quick way to look at um, the distribution of fermentation of the beans, as well as the number of objective defects in the beans, and be able to make a determination, right? And the most important determination that... Um, that we need to consider here, right? Is that, is the distribution of fermentation, so the percentage of unfermented or slaty beans, the percentage of partially fermented beans, the percentage of fully fermented beans, is that distribution of fermentation combined with an indication is, is there mold, is there mildew? You know, are there other defects, insect damage, water damage, things like that. So, um, does that distribution of fermentation and defects match the beans that I got from the supplier previously? And can I use these cocoa beans to make a chocolate I already know how to make, right? This is the reason for the cut test. This is why it was developed, right? It was developed so that it was number one, easy to implement, you know, while you can get an expensive guillotine to do this, you can cut the beans by hand. You can train people. It can be done by people, um, you know, you know, in any language, you know, in any culture, relatively quickly and relatively inexpensively to be able to perform a test and look and go, oh, these beans match the specification that the buyer wants, right? And the buyer will say, oh, if these beans match that specification, I know within a range, I know that I can use these beans to make the chocolate that I made with beans from this origin last year, right? That's why cut tests were invented. Cut tests were not invent invented to be an, a tool for the objective measuring of quality, right? Because quality means different things to different people, right? If I'm an industrial chocolate maker, the aspect of quality that I'm looking for in a cut test is, is it a known quantity, right? You know, is it consistent with what I already know about these beans from prior harvests, right? And so for a, an industrial chocolate maker, that's the important aspect of quality that a cut test will give them. You know, are there defects in it? So I know that, you know, I can't use more than 1% slaty beans. I know that I, you know, can't use more than one or 2% moldy or mildewy beans. You know, I don't want any insect damage, right? Now it doesn't get you at really, you know, other important defects which require, um, you know, um, laboratory sampling equipment, like what is the free fat, fatty acid component of the beans and things like that, right? But it is designed to allow a relatively quick, um, relatively unskilled worker to be able to perform this test, right? And so we can make this, make this really, really quick evaluation of the suitability of the beans that are in hand. The cut test was never designed, right? As an indicator of the subjective quality of the beans. Right. I want to say hello to Mark, who's tuning in from Denver, and Julian, who, are, who is um, who is tuning in from Brazil. Thanks for very much, everybody, for being here um, today. And so, you know, this is really why the cut test was invented, right? And it is, in fact, 
you know, in my, in my view, um, the one thing that everybody gets wrong, right, is that percentage of well-fermented beans is not an objective measure of quality, right? So an 80% well-fermented beans doesn't mean that the beans are good. It doesn't mean that the beans deserve to stand alone in a bar of chocolate all on their own, right? All it is is an objective measure of the percentage of beans which have achieved a certain level of fermentation. Now, what's really important about this is that there is a standard reference image. I, I will include it. I will have to go find it and I will include it um, in the post for today's live stream. But this standard reference image was developed over 20 years ago, right? And almost no one is working from a first generation copy of the image. They're working from, you know, a color photocopy or a digital scan of an original, right? And they're looking at it on their phone or they're looking at it on a screen. And so there is no definition for what you know, the color of slaty is, there's no definition for what purple is, there's no definition for what brown is. So, and we don't have a, a good visual reference for what those things are. So what everybody gets wrong is the assumption that anything under 80% well fermented means the bean is under fermented, right? Anything over say 90% fermented means that the bean is over fermented. And what I want to do right now, if there's nothing else that you walk away from this this hour with is that just forget that notion. Just it does, it's not a concept that is useful to anyone. And in fact, it can be harmful. So what I wanna, what I wanna suggest, not what I wanna say, what I wanna say is that um, I had been thinking about the cut test this way in terms of percent well fermented for you know, the first, you know, from 2003, the first time I saw one at origin in Ecuador until 2014 or thereabouts, um, when I did the first Academy of the Cacao with Ingeman down in Nicaragua. And there, um, it was made extremely clear to me that we need to put our evaluation someplace else. So what we, what we want to do is we want to think about the beans themselves and the genetics of the beans, right? And what is the purpose of fermentation? So one of the purposes of fermentation is to take complex chemicals, proteins, um, carbohydrates, and break them down into simpler chemicals. And we do that through this you know, primary fermentation process, which convert, where, in which yeasts convert, take sugars and convert that into alcohol, but also heat. And that alcohol and heat penetrate the bean, and they put together um, a whole complex that they put together. They're responsible for a whole cascade of complex chemical interactions, which, which uh, reduce these um, um, complex chemicals and turn them into simpler chemicals, and also chemicals which can then be acted upon by the second phase of fermentation, which bacteria, um, so Acetobacter and Lactobacter primarily, are going to go and convert the alcohol into acetic acid. They're also going to be generating heat. Um, this acetic acid is also going to be penetrating the bean to the center. Um, and it is, in fact, partly that um, the heat and the penetration of the alcohol and the acetic acid, which are going to lead to the fissuring and complete fermentation. So a lot of this is temperature based. If you have a bean that's in the corner of a square box and it never warms up to a particular temperature, is only at that temperature for a certain amount of time, it's not going to be fully fermented. But we need to take a look at the fact that beans um, of different origins um, have different native pHs. So part of this is the citric acid content of the bean, right? So you'll get a West African, a Melanato forestero out of Africa, which will have a higher pH, starting pH, for example, than a Trinitaria, which is grown in this case in Nicaragua, which will have a lower pH. And what we're really looking to do is we're looking to understand what is the effect of fermentation on the pH value of the bean, as well as a bunch of other complex chemical interactions, right? But we also want to go think of fermentation as a Gaussian distribution, as a bell curve. And what we have is we have a peak point at which fermentation is optimum. And if we know about the microbiology of the fermentation pile, if we know about the specific genetics of the cocoa bean, we understand the varieties of yeast and the varieties of um, bacteria that are in, um, we're doing, again, the microbiology. Um, what we can do is we can tailor the time and temperature, right, of fermentation um, to be able to move 
um, where that peak is. So if, the, if we're very, very careful right at the peak, um, once we get past that peak, right, what we're doing is we're essentially fermenting out a number of um, flavor and aroma chemicals. So for example, and as we move down the scale or as we move past this optimum point, what we're gonna do is we're gonna end up with flavors that are predominantly cocoa and predominantly nuts, predominantly chocolate until we get to the over fermentation um, stage. And what we're doing is we're generating off flavor. So the hammy note that some people think of, which is not smoky, but it's, it's smoked meat, um, which most people find to be uh, a defect and undesirable. So what we're looking for is we're looking at that peak point, right? And depending upon the variety of the bean, the genetics of the bean, that peak point is going to be at a different place. And so it might be at 70%, right? This is perfect for a West African, a Melanato Forestero, for which your primary interest is in cocoa flavor and chocolate flavor, right? But if what it is that you're interested in is all the other really interesting fruit flavors and aromas, floral flavors and aromas. By the time you get past that peak and you start getting to the point of, you know, fermenting in the cocoa flavors, what you've done is you've fermented out all these wonderful chemicals, right? And those chemicals might be in that bean at 38% fermentation or 40% fermentation or 50% fermentation. And this is in the fact the case um, with some of the beans from, from Ingemann. Um, if you're looking for an acriollado, which is a mix of a neo-criollo, it's a, it's a mixture of criollos and trinitarios that came back from Trinidad that are you know, fairly common in Nicaragua um, um, and, uh, and other places um, throughout the Americas. Um, you'll find that there's a high percentage of white beans um, or a percentage of white beans. There'll be a percentage of what are called lila or lilac colored beans. So they'll be pale pink, dark pink before you get into the violet, right? And if you over ferment these, um, these paler colors and get them into brown oxidizing cocoa flavors, then what you've done is you've just fermented out all of the interesting bits. And so if you were to do a cut test on, for example, some of these acriollados, which are high, you know, got a high percentage of lila, or lilac colors, pink colors in them and white colors in them, and look at them and say, oh, you know, fermentation here is only 65%. Therefore they're under fermented. Therefore they're incapable of making good chocolate. I'm going to reject them, right? You've just made a huge mistake, right? Because chances are all the interesting flavors you're looking for are in those beans that you think of as being under fermented, right? This fermentation is based on brown. Well, fermented is often based on a, an idea of what brown lo should look like. And you got to be really careful about that. So um, in this, this is one of the reasons why I particularly love the Cocoa of Excellence protocol. What they do is they look at the beans, they convert them into liquor, and then they convert them into chocolate. And what they're looking to do is, do these beans make good chocolate, right? And if the beans make good chocolate, you know, the actual distribution of fermentation, right, is useful to you if you decide to go back to the same supplier year after year after year. Right, right. So I know that if I get beans with this distribution of fermentation, I can make, ooh, this really, really interesting flavor chocolate. And so the next year, I want to make sure that I get that same distribution of fermentation. But if what you said is, oh, it's not 80% well fermented, right, therefore it is under fermented and therefore it is bad, you've made a huge mistake. And I know I'm repeating myself here, but I really want to make it very, very clear, right? When you look at a cut test, for a bean that you've never seen before, right? The objective evaluation criteria that you're looking for are number one, what is the percentage of completely unfermented beans? So unfermented beans, what we call slaty beans, uh, because they resemble slate tiles um, or slate roofs, um, that surface texture and color. These are beans which are only going to introduce um, negative flavors and aromas in chocolate. So they are going to contribute to the sense of astringency and there's going to be probably a minerality or a similar kind of flavor component in them. So when you're doing a cut test, you wanna look for the percentage of completely unfermented beans, so slaty beans, right? Then you're also looking at the cut test for 
okay, um, you know, is there any obvious insect damage? Is there any mold? Is there any mildew? Is there obvious, you know, damage which might have come through for shipment, right? You can note the percentage of distribution and fermentation, and you should probably take a picture of it as well as write these things down in a log so that you have them together, right? Um, but then that becomes data for when you convert, right, the beans in the liquor and then into chocolate, right? Um, right, but if you, uh, it, it, you know, I feel like I'm just, you know, repeating myself, you know, over and over again, and I don't mean to repeat my, yeah, I do mean to repeat myself over and over again, because I think this is really important. This is what everybody gets wrong about the cut test, that somehow they think that 80% well-fermented is the standard of quality for beans when evaluating a cut test. The answer is maybe it is, right? If you're working with an Amelinado Forestero, probably grown in West Africa, but could be grown anywhere in the world, and your primary interest is in producing a chocolate flavor, a cocoa flavor, that the thing that Ghana is known for, the thing that, you know, the Ivory Coast is known for, mm -hmm. those kinds of flavors, then yeah, 80% well fermented is a good benchmark. But if what you're interested in doing is using another variety of bean, something that's got any Criollo slash Forestero or Criollo Trinitario genetics in it, right? Then you probably want to think about lower um, fermentation levels, fully fermented fermentation levels, because what you want is you want the precursor chemicals, right? That haven't been cooked out to be able to deliver these interesting fruit and floral and other kinds of flavors that we're looking for in chocolate. Um, so I'm, I'm taking um, a call from uh, a, a a, call, a, a comment from Juan Gonzalez of Mabco in Canada. And Juan is going to be a guest here on the Chocolate Life coming up. So um, he is an importer. Um, he is from, um, uh, he is from, I forget, originally, El Mexico, I believe, uh, originally. Um, and he's working on distributing cocoa beans and coffee um, out of Canada. And Juan says, in every origin of our purchases, we did a cut test of the finish of the fermentation and after sun drying of the cocoa beans, and also before the pre-shaped examples, and yes, you're right, is just to monitor the average if the consistency of the lots, you know, absolutely, right? These become data points, which inform decisions, right? Later on, when you convert the beans from their bean stage into liquor and into chocolate. But when you try to make objective evaluations of beans, the first time you have ever seen them, and this is important. If you've never seen a bean before, you do a cut test, you look at it and you go, uh, it's only 50% well fermented, I'm gonna reject it. Wrong, you've just completely misunderstood what a cut test is for, right? And so I wanna thank you know, Juan for doing that. And yes, I mean, if you're involved in purchasing cocoa beans, you wanna make sure that you have um, cut tests as soon as possible, um, may, maybe during fermentation, maybe right after drying, you want to make sure that you've got them, you know, before they get put into a container, you want them after they come out of the container. And if you're really smart, what you do is you have a contract with your supplier that allows you to reject beans if they are different from the agreed upon, agreed upon standard, right? And this is part of um, the international cocoa trade. Right. It is what enables, you know, a buyer for a big industrial company, you know, headquartered in Chicago to pick up a phone to some broker in you know, Cameroon or Ghana or and say, I want to buy 40 tons of spec. If I was in Ecuador, probably better, you know, AAS. Right. And the broker will go, OK, I know where I can get those beans and put them on a container and I'm going to I'm going to send them to you. And then when they show up at the port, uh, the buyer will be able to run a cut test and they'll go, oh, you know, the beans are within the spec. I'm going to accept them and I'm going to finish payment for them, right? Um, if you don't have that luxury as a buyer, what you're doing is you're assuming all the risk associated with it. And you need to find a way, do you have a way to arbitrage that risk? Do you have proper insurance? Does your importer and distributor have proper insurance, right? If the beans get damaged um, during shipping because of moisture, condensation, right? It's really, really important that you have this record, this testimony, this objective evidence of what the condition of the beans was, but you cannot use that objective evidence from the cut test to make a determination of the quality of beans, of the suitability of beans to make any particular chocolate, right, on their own. 
If you have a history of using their beans, absolutely yes. Those particular beans, absolutely yes. You can use the cut test as a way to say, I know these beans will make a chocolate I already know how to make. But if you've never seen the beans before, do not use the cut test as a way of measuring quality. You need to roast them right? You need to convert them into liquor. You need to convert them into a chocolate. You need to understand the flavor progression because it may be that there's something in those quote unquote under fermented beans that will deliver a really, really interesting flavor profile in a chocolate. So, right. Don't reject beans out of hand, especially ones you've never seen before, uh, just because you think they are, um, have a lower level of fermentation that um, you think is good. Right. So, the who, where, and when of cut tests right, is, a, is a really, really interesting topic. So who performs the cut test, where the cut test is performed, and when the time of day the cut test is performed all have an effect on the results of the, of the cut test. Because remember, excuse me, this is a visual observation. You're looking at these things, right? And what does that mean? Well, um, this is a photograph. I use this um, as part of my presentation for uh, Jeff Abella of Mocha Origins was on as a guest a couple of weeks ago. And here he is um, in Cameroon on the farm doing a cut test in bright sun. So it's almost around noon. I'm looking at the shadow. It's not quite noon, but he's doing it in the open sun and he's doing it against this tan background against this uh, mat upon which all the beans um, are spread out. Right. And I don't know about Jeff and I don't know about the, the person. Jeff is in the white t-shirt. I don't know about the person in the blue, but I am very slightly red, green, colorblind, right? And I know that the way I interpret color is different from the way everybody else interprets color, right? And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I just know that when it comes to certain kinds of color that I am just really bad at judging it. So for example, if I were to do this against a green background, right, or do it against something which is uh, reddish tinted, my perception of the colors would be very, very different. So in the open sun, right, you got to be careful because you have the color temperature of the light, right? So this would be different if it were nine o'clock in the morning, noon, or five o'clock in the afternoon. The colors that they're seeing are going to be different, right? Just it's it's just the law of physics. It's the human perceptual system. It is going to be different. So if you're doing this you can, you can make some observations, but other observations are going to be influenced by the environment that you're looking at. You know, here is um, a cut test. Um, it is, this is the image that is the uh, image for today's post on the Chocolate Life. Uh, this was taken in Venezuela in 2006, I believe. And here we are. It's um, late morning, about 11 o'clock, if I remember correctly. And we're under a, um, a, an awning of some sort um, in sort of open shade. Now, you know, I'm looking at this and, you know, take a look at the color and the texture that's around the guillotine, right? And then take a look at the color of the guillotine itself, right? All of these things are gonna have an influence. So if the color of the walls, if the, if the walls are painted blue or the walls are painted pink, the color temperature of the light in the room is going to be different. And it's gonna affect your perception of what it is that you're seeing. This is also open shade. Um, it, I believe it is um, at the same location as the previous image was taken, just slightly different um, location, a different cut. Um, it's the same guillotine. Um, this is the guillotine um, that, um, Sean Eskenazi purchased. I, I visited Sean on his first bean buying trip to Mexico and Venezuela back in 2006. And that's when these were taken. And, um, you know, the guillotine is, is silver, right? And that's a good thing to know. Um, and, but you can see that the background is a different color, right? So, and it doesn't have the same texture. So, or maybe what's happening here is the sun has come out from behind a cloud. It's in exactly the same place. It's just that now we have bright sunlight behind us rather than cloud cover. Really, really important. As you're doing a cut test, this becomes an important influential thing, an important influencing factor on your perception of what the colors are in the cut test. So here we are, this is in Ecuador in 2005. Um, again, this is again with Sean Askinosi and a group for the um, 
the University of Chocolate that Pierre Richard of Vintage Plantations put together in 2003 and 2005 in Ecuador. I was there on both trips, we were just fabulous. But you'll notice that the guillotine here um, is anodized green. All right, so you know, hopefully um, you can see that. Can I zoom it up? So you can see that there is a green um, there. I, I don't know if you can do that, but you know. Um, by the way, this presentation is up on the Chocolate Life. Um, if you go over to the Chocolate Life right now and you click into the Chocolate Life, the post for today and scroll down, um, what you'll do is you'll find that today's presentation is embedded into the, into the post and you can download it. Um, there's also an ISO standard for cut tests. Now, um, unless you want to spend 118 Swiss francs to actually purchase it, um, all you can do is look at some of the definitions up front. Even they are worthwhile in taking a look at. Um, but if you are in the business of making chocolate and buying cocoa beans, that absolutely understanding what the ISO standard is for performing the cut test, right? So buying a copy and studying it and knowing what it is, is something that I recommend everybody, everybody do. So I'm going to jump back into um, the presentation, um, right? So, you know, it, it's less obvious. This guy is using a blue checkered shirt. He's wearing blue jeans. These are you know, and we're outdoors, it's early afternoon, we're in the shade of a building, but we're outdoors. There's a door and we walked into a balcony um, off the back of the building. Um, this is at Tule Corp in Waikil, if anybody want, if anybody's ever been to the Tule Corp factory in Waikil, this is where this was taken. Um, and our perception of the colors is going to be very, very different. So really, really important to understand that. Um, here's a cut test that was taken indoors. So this is late afternoon, it's inside in a warehouse with no lighting other than the late afternoon lighting that's coming in. Now, it's difficult to tell in this photo, but if you go over to the Chocolate Life, um, what I've done is I've put these two photos um, back to back. So this is the original photo that came out of the camera, uncolor corrected. All I've done is to crop it. And then I took that same crop and color corrected it. Um, let me make sure, whoops. And then color corrected it. It's really, really subtle um, here, um, right? Um, I don't know if you can see it, but if you down, if you go to the website and you go click on this gallery and you go back and forth between these two pictures, what you'll do is you'll see that they are in fact different colors, right? Which says that, you know, again, this is indoors, right? It's late afternoon, right? And um, the color that I'm going to see when I do this cut test is going to be different. And I wanted to show you just a little bit about how different that, that can be. And it could be enough to, I mean, it could be enough to influence your perception of what proper colors are, right? So, you know, this is something that I learned, um, this notion of simultaneous contrast through the paintings of Joseph Albers was something that I learned, you know, back in art school in uh, Rhode Island School of Design in the um, early 1980s. But prior to that, um, when I was living in Oregon after spent taking a break between my freshman year at the Evergreen State College and before going to Rhode Island School of Design, spent three years in Portland, Oregon. And I befriended a, um, a wildlife painter, a guy who did paintings um, on the skill level of John James Audubon, just amazing um, bird and animal uh, wildlife illustrations, just, you know, absolutely amazing work. Um, and had the opportunity to travel with him. Um, one day we decided to go take a picnic and uh, he opened my eyes literally to this notion of, you know, the only reason the green of those trees is that green is because the sky is that blue. And if we were to change our position and looked at a different blue, our perception of, the, our perception of those colors would be different. Both of the colors, both the green and the blue would be different because of the juxtaposition. And when we put a flower in the middle of that, all of this stuff changes. Um, and that's actually the basis for my approach on tasting. You know, what we taste, the order we taste, right, is going to affect our perception of taste. And especially if we're doing pairing, if I'm pairing a chocolate and wine or a chocolate and a beer or chocolate and something else, right, or even chocolate to chocolate, the order in which we pair is going to affect our perception of things. It's really, really important to understand just how prevalent this whole notion of um, the color temperature of light, right? And the colors that surround the environment that we're in are going to affect our perception of color. 
And this is going to have a perception, um, an effect on a perception of the cut test. Um, so um, there's one thing I can recommend to do. Actually, there are two things I can recommend that people do. Number one, um, let's talk about this. If I were going to be in the business of making chocolate on a regular chocolate daily and was in, had the task of evaluating cocoa beans on a regular basis, what I would do is I would set up a, a light booth, right? And that light booth would have a, an illumination source, which was known to be flicker free, right? And was at a very, very specific, color temperature is important, right? Um, specific color temperature, um, but also it was a steady color temperature, right? So it didn't change as the bulbs warmed up, for example, right? And that I would have a standard white color background, right? Um, this is, these light booths are often used um, in evaluating printing quality, for example, right? Whether you're doing um, uh, lithographic prints or photographic prints, you're going to put it under a light source, which is known, a reference light source, and you're going to do all of your color evaluations in that light source. So it is a specific brightness and a specific color temperature, and all of the colors of the walls surrounding you are the same color all the time. And that is one of the things that I would do, right, if I were personally involved in making chocolate and was using a cut test on a regular basis and wanted to do this evaluation of fermentation based on color. Um, that that's what I would do is I would make sure that the environment that I worked on was the same, you know, and if you really wanted to geek out, have your, have the people who are doing this take a colorblindness test and understanding how acute their color vision is would also uh, be really important because I know, right. That um, I am red, green, colorblind to some extent, and I'm going to see colors differently from the way everybody else see colors. I mean, when I was, you know, again, studying photography at RISD, my approach to color photography was built on that whole notion is that I see color differently from the way other people see color. Um, and it became a part of the, the vocabulary of uh, the work that I was doing. I didn't see it as a limitation, right? That I couldn't see color the same way everybody else saw color. I just saw it as a characteristic of the medium, something I could play with, right? Um, but it's important that you understand this about yourself. <laughs> it's important that you understand this about yourself, right? And that what you might want to do is you might want to keep some reference beans and some reference images around to be able to say, when we in our company say fully fermented, this is what we refer to, right? When we say slaty, this is what we refer to, right? When we're saying this is a lilac bean, you know, this is what we're referring to. When we say this is a, a porcelana white bean, this is what we're referring to. Really, really important to have those reference standards so that people who are coming in behind you can go, oh, here is what it is that we're comparing against, right? Um, and so this is one of the things that you can do to up your game, right? Um, what I want to say um, is there's one other technique um, that you can use to up your game, um, and it's counterintuitive, um, and it really only applies if you're using a guillotine, right? This is not something you can do if you're cutting beans individually by hand. You need to be able to, you need to, be able to cut a lot of beans um, in one fell swoop, right? And this is a technique that was taught to me, um, shown to me by Ed Seguin. And so if people don't know who Ed is. Um, he's among other, among all the other amazing things he's done in his career. Um, he has been involved in the development of the Cocoa of Excellence protocols. He's been involved in the development of the protocols for the Heirloom Cacao Preservation Project. You know, this guy, he knows what it is that he's doing when it comes to the evaluation of cocoa beans. So one of the things you can do to up your game is that after you slice the beans and after you remove the pressure, so remove the nut, right? Right. Open up the guillotine and smell, right? So there's going to be some friction, which is generated by the knife going through, right? And preferentially you do want a, a blade, which is on the duller side rather than on the sharper side. So you're breaking through the beans. Um, but what is the aroma that comes off those freshly cut beans, right? You know, you're cutting 50 at a time, right? You're getting the aggregate of all these aromas. You know, are you getting grassy notes? Are you getting vegetal notes or other vegetal notes? Are you getting floral notes? Is it just straight chocolate? Is there something that smells off, right? 
This is a data point that you can use when doing your cut test that will tell you as much or more about what the beans are capable of than just looking at them. Right? And so I really, really highly recommend um, um, thinking about um, putting together another evaluation, using a, getting another sense involved in this, not just looking at things, but smelling things in the process of doing your cut test. I was blown away, right? The couple of times I've done this, you know, go take a, go take a, a Ghana, a West African, you know, forest arrow uh, and a melanado and do a cut test on it and you do that and then get some really, so get some real, you know, nacional coming from Ecuador that has got that classic Ariba um, orange blossom, jasmine, floral flavor, and do a cut test on it and smell it immediately. And you will be surprised. I mean, shocked perhaps, right? At how different they are and what kinds of clues that aroma, that, that, that smell will tell you about the chocolate that can be made, about the potential, the flavor potential of the beans you have in your hand. And I now value that evaluation as much or more than looking at the absolute distribution of fermentation um, of the beans. It's been really an eye-opening um, technique for me. And, you know, I don't know if, you know, if Juan, you're still in the room, um, you're, you're, you're watching on uh, Facebook. I don't know if this is something that you have ever done, or if there's anybody in the room who's done a cut test, please let me know if you have ever, uh, if you've ever smelled your cut test and what your thoughts are about that idea. I do want to say hello to Enrique, who's calling from Peru, um, um, joining us today from Peru. Thanks for letting us know. So we've got Brazil, Peru, you know, the United States, Canada. It's a pretty good distribution of people who've participated um, in the comments today. And I want to say thank you to everybody for joining me. And if you have any question about anything that I've said um, during the course of the last um, 40 minutes or so, um, please let me know, um, you know. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to communicate to you what it is that I have learned, right? Um, I don't know everything, right? Much as I might want to know everything, it's impossible to know everything. Cocoa and chocolate are just too complex for people to know, um, for anybody to say they know, you know everything about everything. Um, these are the lessons that I have learned that I'm sharing with you. If you have particular experiences that are different or want more information about any of these things, just ask the question. Um, and I'd be happy to do it. I want to say thank you, uh, Juliana. Great content as usual. You know, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, you know, I know that uh, you're doing some really, really interesting things um, in Brazil uh, in terms of being able to introduce people to cocoa, perhaps Brazilians, especially um, in a way that they may not be familiar with. And, you know, you know, it's really, really important that we all share in all of the education we have because it provides complexity and depth and breadth um, that helps us understand um, this, this product that we, we all love so much. Right? Um, and then the next slide is, so my pet peeve. Right? Um, I say pet peeves, I don't remember if I got more than one in here. Guillotine prices. Um, why do guillotines cost so much? right, is a really interesting question, right? Um, I, I think I know an answer. Um, I'm not happy with that answer, um, but I think I know um, an answer. Um, and that is that, number one is, on the grand scheme of things, you know, we're not selling a million of these every year. If we're selling a couple hundred or a couple thousand of these, that's probably it. And so there aren't a whole lot of economies of scale. Um, to be um, had in terms of the manufacturing of these things. The other one is um, if we go and look, um, if you go look at one of the pictures of a guillotine um, that are on the post for the chocolate life, go ask yourself, how is this manufactured? Right? What, you know, how complex is the geometry, the internal geometry of this thing? What are the bits and pieces right, that go into putting together one of these things. And what you, and how heavy are they? I mean, the, the, the standard guillotine that most people use, it's, a, we call it a magra. It's from a Swiss company called Tesserba. Um, a guillotine weighs three and a half kilograms. 
it's like eight and a half, nine pounds. But it is, and it is, you know, it's made from machined out of solid blocks of metal, probably aluminum, right? And so when you think about what it takes to individually machine, CNC machine, every single one of those, you know, these um, ovoid shapes on either side of the guillotine, when you think about what it takes to machine those and then to be able to machine the channel and put the rubber in them so everything is centered properly and then to be able to get two pieces which are going to hinge together and fold together, right? And are going to be able to withstand the force of the blade cutting through them. It is the amount of time in a very expensive machine, right? Coupled with the fact that we don't make and sell many of them that are the reason why these things are so expensive. And so we have a whole bunch of people who are out there. Um, they're using a, uh, a pocket knife. Uh, some people are using a kind of cutter, which is used to cut um, plastic plumbing. So it uses a razor blade, um, a safety blade, uh, like you might find in a box cutter. Right? They'll, they, it uses those as the actual blade. Um, it has the advantage of having jaws that you can center the bean in. But if I'm doing these cuts one by one, it's relatively... Um, it doesn't require an expensive machine. It requires a lot more time in order to be able to do it. Um, but I think, unfortunately, what you do is you lose the ability to be able to smell the cuts um, in, as, you, um, as you open up the guillotine. Um, I would also say that you know, these things are about 1,000 euros, something like that, 1,100 euros um, right now. Uh, that was pre-pandemic the last time I asked the price for them. Um, that if you're importing you know, cocoa beans, which have a value of, you know, many, many thousands of a cost to you of many, many thousands of dollars every year. And you're converting it into chocolate, which has got a value, which is many times greater than the cost of the beans you're getting. Then saying to yourself, well, I don't have the budget to buy an indispensable tool, right, to do my job. I think you're making um, a short-sighted decision. Right, you know, you're being penny wise and pound foolish, right? And that this tool can be an important arsenal, uh, an important tool in your arsenal for being able to develop a high quality chocolate. And I recommend them. I do think there are ways to make them less expensive. I have seen them made out of high density plastic, so high density polyethylene, but unfortunately, <laughs> they've been CNC machined. Um, so they still, re so even though the material is less expensive than billet aluminum, which is used as, and they're lighter, um, it turns out that they take just as much time to manufacture and all the hinging mechanisms I've seen them are very, very poorly considered and so much more difficult to use. But um, I I've seen them made that way for working with um, cutting hazelnuts. Um, that is my pet peeve when it comes to, when it comes to um, uh, cut tests is that guillotines are just way too expensive. I think they're still way too expensive and that people don't consider them to be absolute requirements, right? So for example, if I were making chocolate, right, on a regular basis, um, I would go out and buy a grind gauge or a grindometer. You know, it's a very, very precise machined bit of um, metal um, with a scraper that allows me to see the particle size distribution visually in a chocolate and it allows me to see if there are any larger particles because they leave streaks behind when I scrape it, right? You can buy a, a cheap one from, um, you know, um, from Alibaba or Amazon it will cost you under a hundred bucks, right? It's, they're not the best in the world. Um, and you can spend hundreds, you know, from hundreds more from companies who build these machines for evaluating the particle size that goes into paints or the particle size that goes into the slip that is used for, you know, coating porcelain plates. I mean, um, these can get very, very expensive. Um, somewhere in there is a, is a happy medium. But this, if you are making chocolate and you're all concerned about particle size distribution, spending the extra money compared with getting a, uh, a caliper micrometer. A caliper micrometer will, if used properly, give you the size of the largest particle, right? But it won't tell you the size of the smallest particle. And so it won't tell you anything about particle size distribution. And you need to be very, very careful about how much pressure you put on it as you're cranking it down, right? And you've got a digital one, right? Um, that, you know, yeah, right? 
having a um, having a relatively inexpensive tool to measure particle size, right, makes sense. But if I want to make a quality product, saying, well, I only have you know fifty dollars to send to spend um, when you really need to be spending three hundred and fifty right dollars, um, make doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, at all to be thinking about making those kinds of trade-offs on the equipment that you need in order to be able to do um, a good job. And so um, when it comes to guillotine, I know that they are absurdly expensive. Um, there's not much of a secondary market on them. They don't often come up used, right? But um, when you think about what they can do for you, it's a really, really important tool. When you think about particle size distribution, the absolute right way to go is to get a grind gauge or a grindometer. I mean, this, this is the tool that you need um, to do the work that you're doing um, and to um, shortcut your um, purchasing um, decision, you know, to say, you know, uh, yeah, I know I really need a Phillips head screwdriver, but I only have enough money for a slotted screwdriver. And I'm going to try to make that slotted screwdriver work. All right. Um, you're just making everything more difficult for you and you're, you're doing it needlessly. Or you mean it's, it's more difficult than it needs to be. Well, you know, why should it be that way? Right. Um, and so uh, I want to be, I want to, you know, just suggest that um, you think about these things um, in that way. Right. And that's what I have to say about, about cut tests today. Um, and if there's a takeaway of cut tests, Number one is they are not objective measures of quality. You can't use 80% well-fermented as a benchmark for what quality means, right? Maybe if you're looking at West African, uh, a Melanato Forestero, and what you want to do is you want to create a chocolate in which the primary flavor of the chocolate is chocolate, right? Then 80% well-fermented is a good benchmark. But if you're looking at using heirloom cacao varieties, um, you're looking at things which uh, come from other parts of the world. Uh, you're looking for unique flavors, fruit and flowers and other things like that. 80% well fermented is not a great benchmark. You know, really, really think closely. What you need to do is you need to convert those cocoa beans into chocolate, right? You need to look at the flavor progression from the beans into cocoa or into liquor into chocolate. And what you can do is you can look at the cut test as a way of saying, what is the percentage of slaty, completely unfermented beans, right? Because if they are in your chocolate, there's not a whole lot you can do about that, right? They are going to introduce astringency and off flavors into what it is that you're doing, right? So that's something you can do from the cut test. You can say, oh, again, insect damage beans, mold to, mildew damage, mold to mildew damage in the beans. Yeah, okay, I can do that. And I can say these things are so high, I don't think they'll make a good, a good chocolate. Um, and you can use them as part of a contract with whoever your supplier of beans is to say, I'm going to deliver it to you beans with this particular fermentation profile. If you're a repeat customer, absolutely. But as a first time customer, just in terms of defects, right? Um, that that's what you can use the cut test. And that's what the cut test <laughs> was in fact invented for originally. And so what I wanna do is I wanna take um, the last couple of moments of the hour today is I want to say thank you to everybody who's watching. There was one person who did a, a like, I'm going to assume on YouTube. So if you're watching on YouTube and you can like or Facebook or LinkedIn, do a like, that really does help. Um, um, and I appreciate the support. Um, if you go over to the Chocolate Life um, right now, um, here is the homepage um, of the Chocolate Life. So here are the stories that we're working on right now. Um, if you are a member of the Chocolate Life, um, either a free member or a paid member, um, last night I sent everybody out the April all member update. Um, there are a couple of important things in the all member update. Um, unfortunately, I'm not logged in over here on Safari. I'm Chrome running StreamYard. I'm over Safari. But if you were looking at the all member update, um, there are a bunch of interesting things um, on the Tuesday, the 26th, um, Mickey Mistrati, who is the director of um, the original Dark Side of Chocolate, but now The Chocolate War, which was dropped um, last month, is going to be my guest. We're going to be talking about um, his new movie, um, what he's seen, how it's different from uh, what he learned um, doing The Dark Side of Chocolate a decade ago and progress that may or may not have been made. Um, just this morning, I booked 
um, the director of the, these new um, AVPA awards. So AVPA is the Agence Valorisation for Produits Agriculture. So it's the agency for valorizing agricultural products. It's a French company. And they have a new competition which focuses only at chocolate makers who are working um, in producing countries. And so he's going to be my guest on Friday the 29th um, on this coming Tuesday. All right. So after the Easter weekend, this coming Tuesday, my guests are going to be um, Evald Rieberg and Jan Willem Jekyll of Heinde and Vera in Rotterdam. Um, more, hands down, um, some really, really interesting chocolate makers with a really, really interesting approach doing really, really good work and, you know, good friends. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to be able to, um, to, have, to welcome them as guests. So if you're out there um, watching uh, live or watching at some point in the future, if you're a chocolate maker uh, working in a producing country, if you're a chocolate maker not in a producing country, if you're a cocoa grower, if you're an importer or distributor, um, you're an author, you're a blogger, you're a writer, you have something to say about cocoa and chocolate, and you'd like to be a featured guest on the Chocolate Life Live, um, please go to the Chocolate Life, uh, send me an email, or you can connect to me on LinkedIn, Facebook, or YouTube um, in a private message. And I will work with you to um, get you up um, as a guest because um, um, you know that's what all about, this is all about growing community um, worldwide. Um, other things to know is that uh, on the Chocolate Life, I do maintain a calendar. So here are all of the upcoming stream. So you can see here's today's stream, but we got everything that I've scheduled going forward um, with grays being Fridays and greens being, um, uh, grays being Tuesday and greens being Friday. Um, and then I have an archive of all of the past live streams. So you can go there, these link to the chocolate life and to the post on the chocolate life for either one of these streams. But if what you wanna do is you wanna go straight to the YouTube playlist, you can go straight to the YouTube playlist and you can see we're right in the middle of the chocolate life live um, the deep dive into cut test. But here is where all of the um, Chocolate Life live live streams, they're now, this is number 33. This is where they are archived. Um, and um, please consider supporting. Um, there's always a free level of support. Um, and, you know, this provides me with um, a little, uh, you know, dopamine rush every time I see this. Oh, I've got to remember. Yay. I love that. It keeps me going. Um, but if you like the work that I'm doing and want to support it financially, I appreciate that support. I know it's difficult in these times to figure out where to send your money. But, um, and so I do appreciate those people who do this. I don't do Patreon. I don't do advertising. I don't, you know, none of that kind of stuff. I do some affiliate linking sometimes, books on Amazon and places like that. Um, but um, the way that you out there can support what it is that I'm doing is um, through becoming a member of The Chocolate Life. Um, so please, if you're not a member, go take a look at that. And if you are a member um, and you're a free member, think about upgrading um, your um, upgrading your subscription. So um, I do have a question in from George. I believe George is connecting from St. Louis here in the United States. When in the whole process is a cut test done and how many cuts are done on the same batch and in what locations and how are they transmitted to the, to the buyer? Um, so George, um, if you are lucky, um, what you do is you have a producer. So whether that producer is an individual farmer or it's an estate holder or somebody who's a part of cooperative, um, what you're doing is you're running a cut test um, at the end of fermentation and then at the end of drying. And then you have a cut test um, which is done um, before the beans are uh, put into the container for transport. Right. So what you do is you have a you have a record of all of those things. All right. Um, now, ideally, right. Again, in ideal circumstances, what happens is that the producer, if it's a farmer, right, if they're selling to a cooperative, provides that information to the cooperative, and then the cooperative provides it to whoever is doing the exportation of beans. And what the the exporter does as part of their export record, right, is they attach the cut tests. Right, so that you as a buyer can see that, um, that progression of cut tests. So when the beans arrive, right, let's say in the United States, if you're buying them directly, so you're doing less than container load, LCA consolidation of the beans, right? When the beans come into customs, right? The way most contracts work is that you personally are responsible, right? For doing the cut test at the point of entry into the country, right? Um, so 
now you 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 may do it yourself or what you can do is you can hire an agent to do it for you right and this makes sense if the terms of the contract right allow you to reject the beans right based on um an agreed upon level of defects right so you would do the cut test um um, when the beans arrive. If so, if you're buying through a broker, you're buying from a Meridian, you're buying from Uncommon or somebody like that, it should be your expectation that when they do the acceptance, right, when the beans come off the container, wherever they come off the container, that what they are doing is they're doing cut test as a part of their acceptance process. So hopefully what they do is they have, they are insured against damage in shipment. Right. And so what they should do is the first thing they should do. Right. And as a matter of fact, if we look at, for example, the Federation of Cocoa, Cocoa Commerce, whose rules govern almost all of the cocoa that comes out of actually maybe maybe all of the cocoa that comes out of um, Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire um, and, and West Africa. Um, and if you look at the Cocoa Merchants Association Good Practice Guidelines, um, they actually state that it is the buyer's responsibility to get the cocoa tested and to get it out of the container and off the port basically as soon as possible. And I was involved in a potential legal action around this time last year uh, for a company that um, accepted 4,000 tons of cocoa into Amsterdam and Antwerp. And for one reason or another, I think they objected to payment, but I'm not entirely sure, that cocoa was left in the container for like a month in the container for a month out on the dock um, in the middle of winter. Um, and it, it's, you know, 40% moisture damage or something like that. Um, and there was a question about insurance, who was going to pay for the losses, right? But so the important thing is, is that either you or your broker are responsible for testing the beans at the port of origin, right? Um, and that when you buy beans, right? What you want to do, uh, you want to ask, oh, did you do a cut test, right? When the beans arrived and hopefully they say yes. And then what you want to do is you want to get a cut test when you get them. And what you want to do is you want to compare what you got with what they sent to make sure that they, they match. Now, here's where the ISO standard comes in. The ISO standard says you need to do a minimum of 300 beans, right? Right? And what you need to do is you need to do this 300 beans from a random sampling of bags. Right? So what you do is you take the average of this, of the results that you get from examining. So 300 beans is six different cut tests of beans selected randomly among all the bags that you're testing so that you get a distribution across all of the bags. Um, if you just buy two bags, 300 beans is a lot. Uh, 300 grams, uh, more or less. Um, but um, it doesn't tell you a whole lot if you've only got two bags of beans. But what I would do is I would probably do two cut tests, 100 beans, and I would randomly sample those beans from the two bags that I've got to make, and different places in the bags, right? Because sometimes you get bags which are mixed and you have two or three different producers in the same bag. Um, or you might have a bag which all of it comes from one um, grower, and then you might have another bag from the same cooperative, which comes from another grower. And they're, if you open them up, they look different, <laughs> you know? Um, and so when you do the cut test, you want to do themselves. But ideally, you know, every place the beans change hands, right? There is a cut test. And ideally, every single one of those tests, right, gets attached to the documentation. So when people talk about traceability, right, this is one aspect of traceability that everybody forgets, right? <laughs> it's, it's not just enough to know that, you know, the, the beans went from Fred's Farms to, you know, this cocoa cooperative, and then the Jones company shipped it to the Smith company who put it on a container ship owned by the Johnsons, and it got to the port where the Waynes picked it up to deliver it to your factory. That's one level of traceability, right? But, you know, keeping track of, you know, keeping track of things like cut tests over the course of it is an aspect of traceability that most people um, completely ignore. And it's really, really important. Um, and if I were a chocolate maker and I were buying beans, it's an aspect of this traceability process, um, which I actually 
prefer to think of as chain of custody. We're documenting the chain of custody. And we want to know the condition of things as they change hands from one person or one company to another um, in that chain. Um, that's what I would do, right? Um, and George, that's a, that's a fabulous question. Uh, Juan, thank you very much for um, explaining what it is that MABCO does. I think it's really, really important. And hopefully what it is that you're doing is you're keeping those cut test results and you're sharing them with your customers. I think it's really, really important uh, that people do that. Um, and that we as buyers become more sophisticated in what it is that we're demanding in terms of the documentation associated with um, the movement of beans from the farm, right? Through all of the hands that it takes to get those beans to the receiving dock of our workshop. And with that, I want to say thank you very much to everyone who's been here. If you're not a member, please support The Chocolate Life. Um, and um, as I always do, um, and every single one of my broadcasts by reminding people, if you're working with chocolate and you're not having fun, you're doing wrong. So you're doing it wrong. So please, everybody, go out and have fun working with chocolate this weekend.